Hey everybody, welcome back to Living Traditions Homestead. Well, it is a nasty, kind of drizzly, freezing rain kind of day. This is the second day in a row that the kids have not had school. And right. probably tomorrow they won't have school either because it, we're having kind of icy weather. Right, kind of on and off. It's been raining, you know, drizzling, and then it's staying. It's staying pretty much below freezing, so... Um, I think today the highs are only in the 20s, the lows tonight are in the teens. So yeah, there's probably a good chance they'll be off school again tomorrow, which just makes them feel terrible. <laughs> so we thought since the weather's so cruddy outside and we're really not getting a lot of projects done out there, we decided to sit down and talk with you guys about some of the questions that we've been getting um, a lot lately. About once a month or so, we really like to do these Q&A type videos so that we can directly answer some of your questions. Uh, we don't always have time to answer every question that gets asked in the comments or every question that gets emailed to us, but we try our hardest, but we do have a lot going on here on the homestead, so we like to answer some of the questions that we get asked over and over and over again in these Q&A type videos. Right, we do get a lot of repeat questions. A lot of you are interested in the same things, so it just benefits everybody if we just sit down once a month and address some of those questions in a video just like this. The first thing we wanna to talk to you guys about is a question that we're getting a lot just in the last couple days, and that is, have we had piglets born on the homestead yet? Now you guys are seeing this on Wednesday, but it's actually Tuesday right now. And as of right now, the answer is no, we have not had piglets born yet. In our video, our most recent video on Saturday, we were getting her farrowing pen area ready to make sure that during this really cold snap, everything is warm. She's got nice fresh bedding. Uh, we put up some windbreaks to keep the wind off of her and we added an area for the piglets to get away from the cold and under a heat lamp to keep them warm. Right. Now, one thing a lot of you had concerns about is the heat lamp setup and whether or not that would provide enough warmth for the animals. Some of you also had concerns about the way I hung the heat lamp, uh, hanging it by the cord. I wanna let you know that I did take your advice on that, you guys. I went ahead and I added a chain so that we're no longer hanging it by the cord. It's hanging off a chain. I know that'll make a lot of you sleep better at night knowing that I fixed that. Um, personally, I can tell you for years and years and years, we've done it the other way and never had a problem but I also know that sometimes you get cocky and that's mm -hmm. the time something goes wrong. So I went ahead and I fixed it and I added a chain. The other concern was, what will it be warm enough under that heat lamp? Or too warm. Or too warm yeah. for the babies. So we did buy a thermometer. We've had it under there the last few days so we can really monitor it as the weather gets colder and colder. And it's staying pretty consistently right under that heat lamp, about 75 to 80 degrees. And I'm really thinking that that's going to be a good, a good system. And now that I have the chain on there, I can easily move it up or down if we need to. Also about the piglets, we've had lots of questions about if we're going to be selling them, uh, if we're taking deposits for them, and really what is the deal with all the extra piglets that we're going to have around? What are, going, what are we going to do with them? A lot of you are really interested in buying them from us, and that's fantastic. We're so excited to see so many people interested, um, not only in raising pigs for your own family on your own homestead, but also in these uh, Idaho pasture pigs, which we are absolutely loving. So right. what's the deal? Well, we're not taking pre-orders for them. We have done that in the past with some of our other animals, but because this is our very first time breeding pigs, we're not really sure how many we're gonna end up with. We're not sure if everything is gonna go right. Um, we're just not sure of a lot of things, so we're not taking pre-orders for them at this time. Uh, we've had a lot of you guys uh, be interested in them. What I can tell you is this, after they're born and once we know how many we have, First of all, we'll be keeping our next feeder pigs out of this first group. So that'll right. be either two or three that'll be staying here for us to raise for meat for next year. And then whatever's left after that, uh, we'll post on our Facebook page. Uh, that's where if we have any left that are going to be sold, you guys will see them for sale and it'll really be a first come first serve at that time. Um, now, hopefully we'll be having more litters throughout the year from our other sow and Myrtle will hopefully have a second litter later in the year. And as we get more comfortable with everything, uh, maybe we'll get to the point where in the future we can take pre-orders. Like I said, we're just not 100% sure on everything this time around. So bear with us as we figure everything out. Uh, but we're excited because so far it seems like everything is going really well. We can't wait to have little piglets on the homestead. All of us in the family have been watching 
other YouTube videos about piglets and about sows having, uh, you know, farrowing, giving birth. Uh, it's really exciting. It's awesome to have YouTube as a resource, uh, even for those of us who are on YouTube, to still use YouTube as a resource to learn new skills. So I hope that answers those questions about the piglets that have been out there. Now, while we're on the subject of animals, uh, there was one more question that we've been getting a lot lately, and we happen to get this question quite a bit as we get more close to springtime every year, and that's about raising meat chickens. Uh, we raise the Cornish Cross chickens, and a lot of people want to know what is the best time of year to start with the chicks. And I'll be honest, our advice last year would have been different than it is this year. We learned a lesson last year, uh, and we want to share that with you guys today. Now in the past, we have always gotten our chicks in April so that we are processing in June. That just seemed like the best time for us. April, it's really warming up. We don't have to worry so much about them being cold. But last year, we were a little nervous with the pandemic starting that we would miss the opportunity to order and that when we ordered, they would be out. Right, so, and actually that ended up being true because later in the year, uh, there were a lot of people who weren't able to get chicks because so many people had ordered last year. Right, so we were thinking early and we had our chicks delivered the very first week in March, which allowed us to process those chickens in uh, early May. I think it was either the last week in April or the first week in May. And that turned out to be a really perfect schedule for us. Right. So we're actually doing the same thing this year. We've got chicks scheduled to be delivered the very first week of March, which will yeah put us right at the end of April to process those. And the reason that that works out so well for us is because once we get into May, for us, that is just an extremely busy time of year. That's when the farmer's market really gets busy for yes. us. All of our plant starts are in full swing. Uh, it's the time of year where we start doing a lot of our planting here on the homestead. And from basically May until, you know, September. October, yeah. September, October, I mean, we're just, we're just crazy busy with the garden stuff. So by being able to do the chicks on the early side and have them done before garden stuff even starts, uh, really worked out to be really a good plan for last year. It really took the pressure off of us during that really busy time in the spring. Right. Now, there are a couple downsides to doing them early, and depending on where you live, you may have to consider that, but, you know, it's colder when we get them. It's right. still a lot of times freezing or below freezing when we, when we would get them, so we have to leave them indoors a little bit longer. I think last year we left them in, uh, I think three and a half to four weeks before we let them out into their tractors, which normally right at three weeks we're letting them out. Um, and you know, we have to have a little more heat on them for a little bit longer. So they're, you know, it's a little more work, uh, but the payoff in the end I think was really worth it. Well, that's where we're at with, you know, animal news. We're gonna switch focus to our sprout house. We just recently converted an extra building that we've had on the homestead into our area where we're gonna start all of our seeds and all of our seedlings for our growing and for selling at the farmer's market. We've had some questions about the new type of grow lights that we're gonna be using, and we wanted to make sure to answer those and just kind of give you an update on where we're at with them. They're new to us as well. Right. So we told you guys that in the past, and we've even done videos about this in the past, we've always just used fluorescent shop lights, you know, fluorescent bulb shop lights to start our plants. Our lights were getting older and it was time to replace them. So this year we decided to switch over to LED lights. We, we ended up going with the red and blue uh, LED lights and we've been really happy with them. Although we are starting to learn that there's a learning curve to using sure. them. And there are some real differences between what we were used to, uh, what we've been using for the last 10 years versus these new LED lights. Now I know a lot of you have gone out and purchased the LED lights as well based on our recommendation. Right. So I always wanted to be honest with you guys and tell you what we're learning so that hopefully you can learn from it as well. We've started using the new LED lights just like we used our fluorescent shop lights, which means we start with those lights really close to the soil level while the seeds are germinating. And then as the um, seedlings grow, we kind of raise it up, always keeping the lights about one or two inches above the top of the plants. Um, but we've been finding that that is too close and these lights are 
way brighter, basically. Um, and having them that close is actually not good for the seedlings. Right. A couple of days ago, we started to notice that some of our seedlings were almost looking a little burnt uh, at the very tips of the leaves. And not from the heat. Right. They, they're, because they're LED, they're not giving off any heat. They look like sunburnt almost. Like if, you, if you've ever grown tomatoes and you'll notice that sometimes one side of a tomato might kind of turn kind of yellow from the sun beating down on it in the middle of summer. That's kind of what the plants were starting to look like in certain spots around the edges of the leaves. So that led us to do some more research to try to figure out what was going on. And I'd remembered, you know, before we ever switched over to the LED lights, doing some research about them and reading that you needed to keep them further away from the plants than you did the traditional lights. Although I never could find a real good answer telling us exactly how far. So after doing a lot of research and a lot of nerdy stuff that <laughs> didn't really interest me, but I feel like I have a lot of knowledge now that I didn't have before, uh, we've learned that really these new lights should probably be kept somewhere in the 8 to 10 inch range above uh, where the plants are. So we've raised them up considerably. It's only been about two days since we've done that. So we're not seeing much change yet, uh, but we'll keep you guys up to date on how that's going. But I just want you guys to know that uh, if you're going to be using the LED lights, you may want to research that as well and really figure out, you know, uh, how to use them the most effectively, especially if you're like us and switching from using the older style lights. We can tell that a lot of you are really thinking about spring and gardening season because we're having a lot of views on most of our gardening and planting videos. Lots of questions about how we do things here on our homestead, which is a little bit different than a lot of people grow. We've had a lot of questions specifically about some of the things that we use here on the homestead. And the first big question that we've had a lot is about the woven weed fabric that we use. We've been using the woven ground cover now. This will be our fourth summer using it coming up. Uh, we're just as happy with it today as we were the first year that we used it. It has just been a game changer as far as gardening goes, uh, as far as, you know, the maintenance in the garden and really the overall productivity of the garden. It just makes things so much easier to handle. But a lot of you have had questions because, you know, you can buy different types of ground cover. They sell some, you know, at your local, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart. They sell it in a lot of different places. Um, but the stuff that we use is pretty specific. Uh, as far as I know, they don't sell it in any of those places. Uh, what we use is a product called Sunbelt Woven Ground Cover. It's a 3.2 ounce polypropylene ground cover, and it's made by a company called DeWitt. Um, now, we recommend getting it from a company online called GrowerSolution.com. Uh, you guys have heard us talk about them before. It's a great company. We've worked with a lot. Uh, that's where we recommend that you get it. Uh, but you can get it in, in other places if you can find it locally or whatever. Um, you know, you might be able to get a good deal because you don't have to pay for shipping. But if you're ordering it online, we recommend GrowerSolution.com. Now, the woven weed fabric is just that. It's not like just thick plastic. Right, it's not solid plastic. No, it's actually woven fabric made out of this polypropylene plastic. Um, it acts as a ground cover, which keeps weeds out, keeps moisture in, and actually keeps the ground cooler. Even though it doesn't seem like it would work that way, it does. It actually keeps the ground cooler underneath there. Right, that's because it's woven. It allows the transfer of heat through the through the soil just like a mulch would do right and because it's woven and not just a solid plastic it does let the rain and the water through too right we've had a lot of questions about whether water will penetrate through there right. yes it does now a lot of you have asked us why we don't just use a method like back to eden gardening or the roost out method or lasagna gardening and, and all of those i think have their place I can tell you that for years we used the Back to Eden method when we lived in Arizona, and it worked great. In fact, when we moved here to Missouri, we were pretty cocky about uh, using it here. We, you know, we were telling everybody that, well, you know, we never had weeds in our garden in Arizona. This is going to be no problem. Right. We know exactly what we're doing. I mean, we 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 went all out. We we put down cardboard. We killed out all the weeds. We layered with about six inches of mulch and compost and manure and everything else 
and within probably two months, our garden had weeds almost as tall as me. Yeah. Um, the weeds here where we live in Missouri are just outrageous, and that's what led us to find the woven ground cover. Uh, I think originally, actually, we had seen it being used at Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company, uh, which is near us, where we go to buy a lot of our seeds. We saw them using it. That got us researching it and really fell in love with it. It is approved for organic gardening, mm -hmm. which is what we love. And so uh, for us, it was just, uh, like I said, a game changer. It made the time in the garden more about being able to be productive and less about having to do those tedious you know, tasks of pulling weeds every single day. It definitely made it so much more enjoyable to be gardening. Now the woven weed fabric can be used for multiple years. We right. do take it up at the end of the year so that we can amend our soil and then put it back in the spring. Right. Uh, but it is really thick enough that we're on year four with some of the right. weed fabric that we have. Yeah, and it's still, it's still just as good as the day we put it down. I mean, there are, you know, there, there's gonna get holes in it here and there, you know, you're gonna cut it on accident or whatever. You know, sometimes I've hit some of the edge of it with a lawnmower, which is frayed it out. Um, luckily, you can take a torch and you just kind of seal that back mm -hmm. up. But I mean, so it is going to get worn over time, but I think it's rated for eight to 10 years of use. So, I mean, we're excited about it. Um, we continue to use it year after year. I don't see us ever going back to anything to else. No. Now, like he said, we're going to continue using it. So in our uh, planting videos upcoming in this spring, you'll see us using it again. But we do have several videos already in our, you know, library of videos that if you're interested in learning how to use it, lots of videos for you to, to watch. Right. Now, along with the woven ground cover, a question we get a lot is how do we water through it? Uh, you know, what type of watering system do we use? We've actually done videos about this in the past as well. Uh, but we're going to just review it quickly to, to tell you guys what we do. Uh, we use a drip tape irrigation mm -hmm. system. Uh, drip tape is a type of system that's designed to, to water, you know, bigger areas uh, with very low water pressure and very low water consumption. We have two gardens that we're using this system in. Both of them are about 50 feet by 80 feet. So it's, you know, two pretty large areas that it can accommodate and it does really well. Now we actually put our drip tape on top of the woven weed fabric. You can put it underneath the woven weed fabric, but the reason we choose to do it on the top is if something is going wrong, if it's sprung a leak or if it's clogged up or something and not watering appropriately the way it should, then we can see that right away and we can make those changes rather right. than waiting for those um, plants to die off. And right. then if that does happen, then you're having to take the weed cover up and try to fix it and put it back down. So overall, we prefer to have that drip tape on top of the weed fabric. Right. Some people do put it underneath because they feel like you get less evaporation of the water sure. that way. I completely understand. Yeah. Do whatever works best yep. for you. There's no right or wrong way with that. Like Sarah said, though, on top works best for us. It's just what we've always done. And we're creatures of habit. So that's what we're going to stick with. Now, another thing that we changed just a few years ago in our garden is... Uh, kind of pest control that we do, especially on our early spring plants. Uh, specifically, we started using what are called floating row covers in the garden uh, on all of our brassicas. So all of our cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, collards, all of those plants that really attract the cabbage worms. Because in this area, it's nearly impossible to grow brassicas without an infestation of the cabbage worms. Right. When we first started growing brassicas here, we were trying a lot of the organic sprays and stuff. And while, you know, organic sprays, I mean, they're, they're fine. Um, it's still things that we're spraying on our plants and it was really costly. Right. Yeah. Because in order to keep them under control, you need to spray like a couple times a week, it seemed, to really keep them under control. So as soon as we started using floating row covers, we had no problems whatsoever ever with the cabbage worms. Right, and all of those plants just grew amazingly under the covers. Absolutely. Now, if you're not familiar with floating row covers, what it is is basically a thin fabric that's developed specifically for this purpose that you basically create like a tube of this fabric right down the row of your plants. You use these special wires that you put in the ground to hold the fabric up over the plants and it really 
creates an environment where the bugs can't get in and lay their eggs, which then hatch into these cabbage worms right. and ruin all of your plants. It's really amazing. Right, yeah, the cabbage worms come from cabbage moths, right. which most people never even see the cabbage moths. They only see the outcome of that, which is the infestation of the cabbage worms. But if the moth can't land on the plant, the worms can't grow, and you don't have any problems. So it's just been an amazing thing. Now we've had a lot of questions about what we use for the actual hoops. Uh, you can use everything from PVC pipe, uh, whatever. What we use is a real thin wire. And the easiest way to make those is to go to your local big box store, Home Depot or Lowe's or one of those stores that sells chain link fence. Uh, in the chain link fence area, they have a real heavy wire that's called tension wire. It's what goes along the very bottom of a chain link fence. It comes on a roll. You can buy that and you can cut that to the size that you need. And it's a stiff enough wire that it'll really hold up well on the floating row covers. That's what I recommend. It's probably the most economical way to do it. And then you can just push it into the ground and you've got your floating row covers. The width of the floating row cover that's working really the best for us is six foot wide. Right. It ends up kind of going three feet up, three feet down. Uh, you gather right. it at the end and right. secure it down. Right, it gives you enough room on the sides to be able to set some rocks or whatever to hold it right. in place. Yeah, so this year we're gonna be using that again in our big garden. We're gonna be doing one full row of cauliflower and a half row of collards and maybe a half row of something else. Right. Uh, but we're looking forward to the outcome of that. We love the use of the floating row covers. Right, and then there's kind of a second thing with the floating row covers that it helps with a little bit, and that is some of the frost, if you happen to get a late frost. Now, it's not gonna protect your plants if they're still really small and you get a really cold night. Like I wouldn't be planting your you know, brassicas this time of year, but if you just happen to get a light frost later in the season when the plants are already fairly strong, uh, the floating row cover is going to retain just enough heat to really help them through that. So I wouldn't use them necessarily for that purpose as their main thing, but once you have them out there, it kind of serves a dual purpose. Right, and the floating row cover is you put over the row right when you plant those seedlings right. in the ground. That is a key. You start using them right away to make sure that they never have the opportunity to have that bug damage. Right. Well, we hope we didn't overwhelm you guys with too much information today but these are some of the questions that we get over and over again and hopefully that this will just answer some of those in one big block so you guys can learn and you can really move on with getting your own gardens up and running and planning for this upcoming spring. We hope you guys are enjoying our videos and if you are please make sure to hit the subscribe button below and the best way that you can help us here on the homestead is just to share our videos on all your social media. Until next time, thank you so much for stepping by our homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.